Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Ex Post Watcho, your favorite movie retrospective podcast. Every week we pick an old movie from the past, from the bygone years of, say, the year 2000, and uh, we look at it in 2021 and see what we think. This week, we're going we're gonna to look at a movie by uh, an obscure director, a uh, fellow named uh, Christoph Nolan. Um, he, I think it's um, I think it's Christopher Nolan. I could be wrong. Oh, that guy. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that guy's actually really famous and has made a lot of really good movies. Uh, yeah, we're gonna watch Memento, which is Christopher Nolan's first movie. Uh, came out in the year two thousand. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen this. Uh, Elena, when's the last time you saw Memento? Ooh, a billion years ago, approximately. Um, but he did following before this. How long is following? Is that like 20 minutes? That's not a feature. Oh, oh, did he? Yeah, right, right, I've right. I've seen it, but how long is, is following? I can't even remember because I've seen that. Oh, it is. It's oh, over yeah, an hour. Right. Oh, I just fucking um, got to delete this episode and start over. <laughs> you um, want to start over? No, no, it's fine. <laughs> I, I totally forget following exists. I thought Memento was his yeah. first. I mean, I don't think, I mean, I think maybe it was his first, like, it's um, 69 minutes. That's not a real movie. Memento is like, I think it, the first that maybe had like wide distribution or something. like yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely the first movie that like, I think anybody saw. Yeah. Okay. Uh, following was made for $6,000, made $48,000. That's not bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I saw this uh, around the time it came out. I remember it being a big deal. People were like, whoa, like, again, this is the, the, uh, that's how people react to movies around me. Um, (laughs) this was the era of like fucking twist endings and, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, movies were, were doing crazy stuff in, in the, the late nineties to to early two thousands. And I think this movie is a great example of that. And yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty popular and, uh, a mind fuck as they say. Yeah. Yeah. This is huge. And I was a big fan immediately. I think that's when I immediately went and watched following. Um, I, I kind of was a, a huge Christopher Nolan fan from that moment on. And that has been unwavering despite any less than stellar. <laughs> and what would you can, can you call any of his movies less than stellar? Is that I your mean, bullshit pretty... fucking headline for interstellar? <laughs> You're like more like less than stellar. <laughs> <laughs> I liked Interstellar. <laughs> yeah. I, I liked all his movies. You know what? Even Tenet, people shit all over that. I watched it a couple weeks ago, actually, and I, I really enjoyed it. It was a lot better than what I was expecting just based on people's um, reactions to it and what people were saying about it. So I, I honestly, he always makes things look super cool and he has a way of casting. I think that is just really great. And he's so polished. Um, he wears a suit when he directs there you go yeah i i just think he's 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 a class act in terms of like his work and i do really enjoy it and it's all kind of moody it's all got that kind of same clean polished but moody vibe to it and i really love that so uh, and it's it's that kind of directing where maybe memento is a little bit different but like it's not about look what I can do in terms of like, where is my camera and what is my camera doing? Like, obviously he he uses a lot of like, look what I made the computer do, (laughs) but a lot of his effects are practical as well. Like they, he, he does cool stuff in terms of what he makes people do. I don't know. In Inception, they really built a city that they folded like that. (laughs) It was a train, a model train set. It'll be interesting watching this movie because when I think of Christopher Nolan today, I tend to think of movies like Tenet and Inception and Interstellar, um, which are like, you know, big sci-fi action things with like crazy effects. Obviously, the Batman movies, um, which also are fairly like effects heavy, like they're big budget, you know, like look at this cool shit um, movies. Um, The Prestige too. So Memento is like, kind of not that it's a very like you know it's it's an early director movie so it's like the purest yeah. um uh <laughs> you know it's just like what what kind of cool idea can you execute with like uh you know i assume this movie did not have a huge budget um it's like yeah four and a half million um it's you got your actors you got a script you got some cameras like what can you make happen and i think <laughs> he did something very cool just by sort of like 
you know, maybe Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs are to blame for this a little bit. Like, hey, non-linear storytelling. Remember the '90s, um, <laughs> but but actually doing something very interesting with that premise. And and you know, it's not just like, hey, check it out. Stuff's happening all over the place. It's like the structure kind of works thematically with the story and uh, and adds this like new sort of um, level of suspense. So I think that that'll be pretty cool to watch. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm a I'm a Nolan fan, like everyone else. Uh, mm. I think like my criticism of his movies would be that it doesn't really feel like they're ever much about characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe with the exception of the Prestige, I think the Prestige is definitely more about like the characters and the sort of relationship between them than it is about the the fancy effects and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I guess like Batman's a character, but it just I don't know Inception. <laughs> uh tenet the the people stuff just seems like okay you know leo's sad because he can't see his family i get it but i kind of just don't care for some reason um i like when the buildings (laughs) fold more more uh yeah and um and about tenet specifically that one i was a little bit disappointed with because it felt like just looking through all the other movies i haven't seen dunkirk i'll I'll just put that out there but like i haven't seen that one either you know, they all kind of like are bringing something a little bit different. Um, you know, Inception's got all the dream stuff going on. Interstellar's like a space movie and there's like, you know, time dilation stuff happening. And, and mm-hmm. they made, they use computers to make like calculations for some of those effects. <laughs> Whoa. Um, whereas <laughs> Tenet kind of was like, when I saw that trailer for the first time, I was just like, this is makes me feel exactly like when I saw the trailer for Inception. Like, it, it mm-hmm. feels like almost a little bit of a, a remake or, like, you know, the closest you can get to a remake without it being, like, the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, because I was just like, there's some kind of visual sci-fi premise that looks cool, and I know when I watch the movie, I'll understand how it works. I know he'll tell me, and I really want to know what it is. So I also had that feeling of, like, getting real excited to go see it. Uh, <laughs> except this was, you know, COVID time. So I'm like, well, I'm not fucking going to a theater to see that. Um, <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I mean, overall, I think it works as... Uh, not to crap on it too much. I think it's actually yeah. a totally entertaining Christopher Nolan action movie with some kind of, like, sci-fi crap going on to make it interesting. It just was, like... N- didn't really bring anything uh, beyond that that I would have wanted to see. Also, the fucking dialogue is impossible to hear. Whoever mixed the audio in that movie messed up real bad. Yeah. Yeah, that was rough. I watched that with my parents and my poor father. I don't know that he caught a third of, of what anyone was saying. The Prestige is great. I fucking love that movie. I think that is like an underrated uh, movie. I always forget it's Christopher Nolan that directed it. I think that maybe that's partly why I like it so much because I think it does. <laughs> it is a bit like unique in uh, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I agree. I, I always um, think it, because The Illusionist came out the same year and it was like the same vibes. And uh, I don't think I ever watched The Illusionist. No, I did. Um, but I, it is I, the inferior I think... film for sure. I, well, I had the Prestige on DVD. I watched it quite often. I uh, I like that one too. I yeah, I really like Christopher Nolan. I think I don't know. Like I'm like thinking now, like what's my favorite Christopher Nolan movie? I really loved Memento. I was really into this movie. I'm really hoping it holds up. I think it will. I think because, like you said, it's not. It doesn't rely on effects or like anything fancy. It's about the storytelling. I think Guy Pierce is fucking awesome in this movie and uh, does he give you jude law feelings like a little bit not quite not quite i kind of want to like hang out with guy pierce in this movie but you know what it's been a while since i've watched this so i may come come back after watching this like very warm yeah you you, you'd you'd hang out and be like can you can you show me your tattoos again your stick and pokes (laughs) of your (laughs) your dead wife (laughs) and carrie ann moss too she's i think super underrated as a performer and i just like seeing her she anyway, gives me so. Jude Law feelings. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Me too. <laughs> She's great. Her and uh, Joe Pantoliano. It's like a little Matrix yeah. reunion, probably filmed <laughs> before the Matrix was even released. Was it? Uh, Matrix no. was 99. This came out 2000. Who knows? Oh, uh, yeah. Speculating. <laughs> yeah, we got, uh, we got high hopes for this one. So, yeah, Mr. Nolan, do not let us down. I'm going to go bust out the DVD that I own. 
because yeah. I, I bought it in like 2003 and I still have it. And, Me too. Uh, and you can watch it in like proper order. Apparently there's like some way to <laughs> figure out how to do that. Yeah. Let's make sure we, neither of us do that by accident. <laughs> and then we come back and go, ah, oh, shit. I bet you that's terrible. Or maybe it's good. Who knows? I've never done it. Cause it's, you have to like figure out it's like, it's like, you know, a cheat code almost. Oh, interesting. They, they like you know. buried it. Yeah. Well, all right. Let's go watch Memento. We'll be back in a yeah. bit. We're back, everybody. We watched Memento. I thought it would be funny if maybe we put this part of the podcast at the beginning, but that would actually be a real stupid joke. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're going to be serious here. Uh, Ilana, I know it's been a while since you saw Memento. What uh, what'd you think of it? I loved it just as much as I saw it when I first saw it, as I saw it when I first saw it. I think I'm still a little fucked up by it. <laughs> I just finished watching it. Um, I Yeah, I love this movie. It was exactly as I remember it, and I had just as wonderful a time watching it. And it was long enough that some details I had forgotten about, so it was not... There were moments where I was like, wait wait, what's going on? Who is it? What's happening? So that was fun. Uh, yeah, I love this movie. I can't say enough good stuff about this movie. How about you? I thought it was great. Um, yeah, yeah it's a really good movie. There's a reason people went nuts for it at the time. <laughs> um, you know, I guess the only thing that is a bit of a problem with it is it does kind of like it. You really do benefit from going into it completely like clueless as to what's going on because, yeah. you know, it does have like a pretty big, uh, a big reveal at the end. And the narrative is kind of like it's it's kind of, you know, giving you details as time goes on and you're solving this yeah. puzzle. But it had also been so long that um, there was a lot of stuff that I had forgotten. So I was kind of like uh, puzzle solving the whole time. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's a really good movie. Like it really is. I kind of said this in the intro, you know, it's uh, it's like a director's first movie, technically not his first, but you know, like one of those like really mm -hmm. early movies where you're, you're seeing someone with with pretty limited resources. Um, you know, there's only a couple of, of actors in this for the most part in, in, in main roles, mm -hmm. uh, take an idea and execute it, uh, or execute on it really well and make something super interesting from it. Um, it's kind of interesting watching this compared to contemporary Nolan films. Like you can definitely mm -hmm. kind of see like how with a lot of money he, he would go in a different direction, but this does feel so different in a lot of ways because it is just so simple and it's just like a, like a mystery movie. Um, yeah, it's great. I, I was, uh, I was, I was having a blast. <laughs> yeah. I, I read that they only spent 25, uh, days filming this, um, which makes sense. Uh, I don't know what the budget was. I'm assuming a small, did we already talk about that? I think we did. Uh, the budget was four and a half million. Just yeah. Pretty not, small. Not huge. Yeah. I, I agree. Like, I think I also said that this might be my favorite Nolan movie, and I, I stick with that. Like, I really, I enjoy this movie so much. I think it's just, I, I think the Nolan thing that I see are all the details. Like, I think he's so um, particular about the detail that he he puts into everything he does. And that's really uh, on display here. And I think maybe even more so because it's all about the story and those details rather than just the visuals. I mean, this, this movie still looks great and I think it's shot really well, obviously, but, um, just in terms of the story and those like little nuggets that you get and, uh, and the development of that and obviously how it's executed, you know, going backwards. Um, I think that's very, very Nolan, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was super interesting to compare it to his, more recent work for sure yeah i think the thing that is strong about it is the the story like it's a story mm -hmm. movie more than anything like it does kind of have like you know you could call it almost like a sci-fi hook i mean it's not science fiction but like right. you know some kind of like you know his movies have like a weird like time travel or something kind of kooky like that and it, it sort mm -hmm. of does feel a little bit like that you are kind of time traveling throughout the movie um but but it is it's about 
uh, you know, the details and the, the puzzle and, um, and the characters. I do think this is a, a, a better like character movie than most yes. of his other stuff. Like I actually do feel pretty sympathetic to the main character. Mm hmm even in maybe ways where you shouldn't. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think, I think like the, the sort of three main characters have a fair bit of depth to them uh, yeah. you, with how much you, you see them. Uh, yeah. So the movie opens quite thematically uh, really sets the stage for things. We, we see a Polaroid photograph um, developing in reverse disappearing like a, <laughs> like a fading memory. Um, and we see, Joey Pants uh, get murdered in a pretty pretty gruesome, shocking opening, um, and then uh, and then and then we're off. And basically, the structure of this movie is is kind of like bouncing back and forth between two different time periods. Um, we've got the main kind of plot, which is the uh, you know the story playing backwards from scene to scene to scene, and then intercut with this are uh, black and white scenes of Leonard Shelby, Guy Pierce, the main character. Uh, just chatting on the phone, uh, which he's not supposed to do. Um, kind of explaining, you know, his whole situation and and telling a, a related story of uh, of a gentleman named Sammy Jenkins who has uh, a similar condition as him. So yeah, so basically, uh, we see Joe Pantoliano show up to the hotel, and they go to a warehouse and. Oh shit, he's the guy. He's the guy who killed his wife. <laughs> so he shoots him. Oops. <laughs> so at that point I was like, okay, like I guess he's the killer. I don't know. Yeah, I guess when you it this is interesting because obviously we we already know <laughs> having seen this before that he's not, but when you first first watch it, you're like, "Oh, oh shit." And it makes him so much more suspicious. He's even suspicious now, knowing what has happened. Like he's a kind of a shady character, anyway. Um, I, I love Joe Pantoliano in this so much that when he opens that door and he's like Lenny, Lenny, <laughs> throughout the whole movie he's doing that. That's just burned into my brain, I think. Um, and he's he's always cracking jokes, even in the most serious situations. Like I love at the beginning where he's like, "These tracks are fresh," and he's like, "Tracks? What are you, Pocahontas?" <laughs> like he just. It's kind of a sad scene, especially after you watch the whole thing, because he's really trying to help this guy. Um, and and I don't I don't know, like, I don't think he really <laughs> expects that he's going to kill him. I mean, even OK, so like the end scene in the movie where we start from in Lenny in Lenny's actual story. I mean, there's that moment where he's like. Jesus, I'm a John G, you know, and he, he just sort of like at the end of this, it wraps up to him sort of like, you know, putting the nail in his own coffin, I guess. Um, it's kind of sad for for a Teddy, I guess. Yeah. So that that seemed a little ill advised to me where he's just like, <laughs> hey, guy with a short term memory problem <laughs> and uh, like murderous desire to get justice i'm just gonna throw this detail out you know, i know you love details that my name <laughs> also happens to be the name of the killer um yeah i think that was a bit of a an own own goal there um but that i think that was something with this rewatch that i kind of like i knew he was in this movie joe pantoliano and i like him like he's uh he's a good he's a fun actor he's in um the sopranos a bunch he's like a great character <laughs> in that show um mm -hmm. But I was surprised at how much I just fucking loved watching him in this movie. Like he's so, uh, like he's he's a little bit of a dirtbag. Not mm -hmm. as like I guess the question of how much of a dirtbag is he is open to interpretation. Um, yeah. Like because at the beginning you're like okay, he must be the killer, and you're working backwards like figuring that out. And then the mm -hmm. big reveal is that like he's not the killer, uh, but he has been. Assuming he's telling the truth when he explains all this to Leonard, right. like he was the cop assigned to Leonard's case and he believed him. So he wanted him to get justice and then he helped him do it. But then Leonard didn't remember. So he's just kind of like stringing him along a little bit um, or maybe giving him a purpose or using him as perhaps an assassin for his shady, <laughs> uh, you know, crooked cop deals. Mm -hmm. um, so he's 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 interesting. But where where he definitely succeeds is 
uh, his charisma as a uh, as a person. <laughs> yeah, I agree. He's great in this. I like that picture. I look thin. <laughs> and his hair is a uh, pretty pretty rocking. That, like that hair is so bad. That wig or weave or I, I don't know the difference. Um, there's one shot where he goes to see Leonard in the hotel with the the scene where there's uh, the guy uh, Dodd in the in the closet. And he, it is so visible. I guess four million can only take you so far. I, I didn't <laughs> even notice that it was a wig. Maybe I just like, for personal reasons, I want to believe. <laughs> it was like the little um, kind of uh, just like mesh a perfect, part. Perfect line. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could see that. Uh, yeah, so I guess, uh, kind of going, going back and further in the plot. Um, so we meet Natalie, uh, in a, they're in a diner and she's like, you know, clearly kind of knows him, but he doesn't know her. And she gives him some paperwork on, uh, on John G on, on Teddy. Well, you've jumped so far ahead already. Oh, wait. Okay. Hold on. They, they kill him at the warehouse. He, he's looking at the papers. <laughs> Oh, he meets with Natalie. What did I miss? Well, we we get him. We get him with Bert at the hotel. Oh yeah, okay. Their little exchange. which I think Bert's kind of important to the story. I mean, he's he's sort of not, but he is. And Bert has a line that says, and then he says it's all backwards, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, little- and I just <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say this too. Okay, this this probably doesn't matter to anyone else. But he's got that note that's like, okay, so you also get set up of like, it. this um, tells us like about all the notes he's writing to himself and, and sets all that up. And he's got that one note that's like, shave your left leg. The amount of shaving cream he uses in this scene is excessive. I was like, guy, you, you, would you forget how to shave your leg? I mean, I guess he's never shaved his leg. I guess maybe he's never shaved his leg. Maybe he doesn't know how much to use. That was distracting. He's shaving it so he can do a stick and poke tattoo yeah. on it, which I don't even like. Why would you, does he need to leave a note for himself to tell himself to shave his leg? Could he not just figure that out? He would just be like, do a stick and poke. Yeah. And it's implied. Or he doesn't. And then he just like stabs the needle and a hair gets in there and it gets all infected. And then oh, God. he just wakes up later and he's like, why is my leg all infected? I don't know. <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> Um, also, I love in this in this um, these moments here. First of all, when before you've seen this, like if you've seen this for the first time, you're like, who is on the phone with him? I like that choice to not have a voice on the other end of the phone. And it's a mystery to the viewer. And this is where that starts. Um, but I also. This is where like his tattoos are really revealed as well in the reveal of the John G raped and r- murdered my wife. Um, tattoo which is in reverse so that he can see it in the mirror I think is really uh, a strong moment like again for your first viewing um, it's, it's cause so we finally kind of understand what he's doing because up until this point we're like what we have no idea what's going on like why he killed anyone um, and I love also okay so I think Guy Pierce is the perfect person for this role his voice is the most calming voice I've ever, which is interesting because he's actually an Aussie and his accent is perfect. His American accent. And the moment when he says, I found you, you fuck. Um, I loved that because I feel like, so I know I'm just like shooting off all these points that happened before we meet Natalie, but I, I, it was like really impactful for me. It made me realize, like, they could have played this, like, psycho revenge movie and made him really beyond. But he's, the fact that he's so gentle and he's kind of got it together from almost all of the movie. He doesn't explode. He doesn't freak out except later with Natalie. Um, I think was such an interesting choice because it could have been boring because he's not super dynamic in terms of where his emotions go but he's so compelling and like he really has to carry the the bulk of this movie and he does such a good job it's almost hypnotic yeah i agree i think uh he has a very like 
he's kind of like calm i mean i guess he's an insurance investigator you know so that's kind of maybe the the disposition he brings to things um but he's like very you know calm and affable and but but you know can can get a little uh angry or intense when the the situation calls for it um yeah, there was a bunch of people that they they considered for this. Uh, okay, so I, I was looking at the IMDb trivia page, and there's just a lot of details in here that I feel are like fucking made up. I don't I don't believe all of this, <laughs> but I'm gonna take it as truth. Um, so yeah, the, uh, Aaron Eckhart, uh, Brad Pitt, Charlie Sheen, um, oh no, no. Uh, and Thomas Jane were considered. Uh, I could see the other guys. Yeah, I mean Thomas Jane. Actually, I kind of mix up with Guy Pierce. They're they oh. might be the same guy. Um, I'm not ruling that out. Uh, or apparently, this is the one I don't believe. Christopher Nolan's first choice for the role of Leonard was Alec Baldwin. I'm what? That would have been a way different movie. That would have been more of like the the psycho action yeah. movie version, I guess. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's so weird. Plus, I feel like Alec Baldwin is like significantly older than Guy Pierce, who I think was 33 when this movie was released. So he's in his early 30s when they shot it. Yeah, Baldwin Baldwin would have been a bit older. He still would have been, you know, like 2000 Baldwin. I don't remember what Alec Baldwin was doing in the year 2000. I can't imagine Alec Baldwin's bare chest and abdomen covered in tattoos. I feel like that's a hairy Irishman. Yeah. I think I think that's made up. I think that's the made up one. <laughs> he went and he edited that. Yeah, um, it could have been me. Um, Guy also Guy <laughs> Pierce apparently big apparently here uh, originally was two hundred and thirty pounds before the movie was made and lost right. a ton of weight within a few months to to film it. I guess he was like real real jacked before because he's like he's kind of got the Brad Pitt and Fight Club physique mm. going here, the like skinny but like muscular thing. Yeah, he's very skinny in this movie. Uh, did uh, did he give you the Jude Law feelings? I want to know. I I was warm. I was warm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, also he's he's like looking for revenge for his wife. That's also like very sexy. He. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of a sucker for a skinny guy. He's got those kind of. I mean, we know what the tattoos say. It's not. It's not that sexy. John G. Raped and murdered my wife is not a sexy <laughs> tattoo. <laughs> But, you know, yeah, he looks, I was warm. Also, his hair was very, like, late 90s, 2000s yeah, hair. Definitely. And uh, I'm ashamed to admit it, but whatever, it was working for me. He looks like uh, like he should be the singer for the band 311. <laughs> and, like, that, the hair, it's, mm-hmm. like, it's big. And uh, the thing that looks the most different, I think, compared to today, like, the trend today is you you really go close on the sides like you don't mm-hmm. you don't have like a lot of hair but it's like in his case it's the opposite like i even saw some like fuzzy <laughs> neck hair at one point like yeah. that's disgusting um it's and not he's, <laughs> and he's also got uh he's wearing like a suit for the whole movie that's just like a little bit too big um which i there yeah. is a perhaps story reason for that that kind yeah. of doesn't make sense um yeah <laughs> <laughs> but that also feels very late 90s. Uh, just the whole like kind of big loose fitting suit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he yeah. looks cool. Natalie's Natalie's. How did you feel when you saw Natalie? Because I know you're a Carrie Ann Moss. Um, she's a pretty lady. I still like her. <laughs> you don't want to you don't want to be offensive. You don't want I'm always like, oh, that guy. I'm like so horny for him. He's so fucking hot. And you're like, uh, she's she's a nice lady. <laughs> Uh, I could never bring myself to objectify Carrie Ann Moss. <laughs> uh, well, no, she's interesting because like she is, I think she's like an attractive woman, but she's not mm-hmm. like, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to say this without sounding bad. She, she looks different. Like she's not like, like a s- knockout sexy lady in sort of a cliche kind of way. Like she, yeah, I think it's about how she carries herself too. Um, I was doing yeah. a Google image search of Carrie Ann Moss as I am wont to do. And there was a picture <laughs> that looked like it was from some photo shoot where they really were like trying to make her like look sexy. Like, and mm-hmm. like I could see the photographer telling her to like be hot and it just like looked so <laughs> weird. It was so, so bad, but, but that's kind yeah. of like her thing. I think like, it's just mm-hmm. anyway, I'll leave it at that. I'm going to get tongue tied well, here. No, I, I agree with you. Like, I think she's stunning I think she's beautiful, but she's not like um, 
conventionally attractive, like what is sold to us as being, you know, some perfect, I don't know what. Um, so I like that about her too. Cause I, I, I do think she's stunning. Um, but it's just, there's only one way to be beautiful in Hollywood, baby. I wouldn't call Guy Pierce like a, a conventionally attractive man either, to be honest. Really? Um, but he, yeah. Oh yeah. Not at all. I don't think. Um, but I mean, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think he's uh, very nice. Nice man. Yeah, he's a nice man. Yeah, I, I think he's a nice man. <laughs> nice man with his nice tattoos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and armpit hair, which you don't often see in movies anymore. Men are usually shaved completely everywhere if you see a man with his shirt off in movies. And there was like a, a lot of armpit, underarm hair happening with him and i was like interesting really you don't see that much anymore on film i've never noticed that not like in the old days back in 2000 um speaking of carrie ann moss i think uh her performance in this is really good i i yeah her character is like at times sympathetic and at times like a monster i think i i I walk away from the movie actually feeling mostly sympathetic for her um because her circumstance and like once you kind of know the way things play out yeah uh um okay so like you 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 first see her in the restaurant and she's kind of having a moment with um with leonard and she's like here's your stuff and he's like yeah i don't remember i got a condition blah 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 and she's like okay (laughs) um and then, you know, we go back in time and it's like he wakes up in her bedroom and and at that point they do, you know, she does seem to kind of like actually be into him, um, you yeah. know, and they clearly like slept together. Uh, and you, you go back again and there's like the lead up to that, you know, like making out and stuff like that. But then you go back even more and then she's Wait, just there's a scene where they make out. Well, they don't make out, but like, you know, there's a little bit of lead up right before they they hop into bed. You know what I mean? Oh, they kiss. I didn't... What? Don't they? Did I just make I that up? <laughs> She's like taking a shirt off or whatever. Hold on. I don't I don't think they kiss. Well they don't Also def- when they wake up, he has his pants and his belt on. Oh really? Did I just like I might have just uh filled in some blanks. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they hooked up. All I don't right. know. I because I was confused. I was like, wait, did they or did they not? Because is she using this as a way to manipulate him and, and make him feel closer to her? But then maybe she would have taken off the belt and the pants. I don't know. I'm scrubbing through the movie right now because I need to <laughs> uh, vindicate myself if this is the case. I feel like I would have started physically like sweating if they kissed. Okay, you're don't right. Remember it. You're right. I just looked through. They don't. But like, okay, she no, she like you know takes his shirt off in the mirror and she's like feeling mm-hmm. him up. And then like the next shot is them yeah. laying in a bed together. Um, yeah. But I'm not convinced they had sex because he has his pants and belt on. Well, you know, sometimes you, there's ways. It's more comfortable to sleep in, in pants and, and nature and finds belt. a way. <laughs> I don't. I mean, anyway, agree to disagree. Moving forward, that, the point I'm getting at is that is a <laughs> a like you know tender, affectionate moment between them. Um, that that seems you know like they they actually seem to be kind of having some chemistry there. And you go back to the previous scene and uh, she's well, then then you see her like, oh, shit, Dodd beat me up. Ah, it's terrible. And he's like, oh, my God, yeah. I got to do something. I'm going to take care of this. Um, and then you go back again and then she's like kind of like a psycho, you know, and it's like, oh, no, oh, no. I hate her so much. She's in this terrible. Scene. She's so mean. But but her like acting is so good in that scene. Like it's such a good like. Yes, it's so good. OK, so I hate her because the first thing she does is she puts all the pens away before she even starts riling him up. And I'm just like, you bitch. But that then she, when she leaves the the room she leaves her house and she just sitting there's a shot of her sitting in the vehicle waiting for him to forget so she can go back into the home is so rage inducing cuz you feel so bad for Leonard at this point and he's he's playing it really sweet at at the beginning like he's like okay calm down like why i don't remember like and um god the things she says to him when she comes in and when she and or before not when she comes in, like when he hits her and then when she leaves and comes in 
she does this great job of like acting like she's not acting very well, which I think is hard to do. She's per- like, I hate her so much in this moment, but like she does such a great job. Yeah, after like she basically insults him and his wife and is just like, basically. I'm going to manipulate manipulate you and use you and uh, and you're not even going to remember it. And eventually he like gets pissed and like slaps her or throws her on the ground or whatever. Uh, and yeah. then she like, yeah, she goes outside and she sits in the car and he's like, you know, frantically looking for a pen. And then they cut to a shot of her like sitting in the car just with like the smuggest facial expression. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's a very hateable uh, face in that moment. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Sorry. Her motivations to me seem a little bit confusing sometimes. Um, Like. The time they spent together, like after they've slept together or not. (laughs) They did, they did sleep together. We at they least slept together. Not sure if they had sexual intercourse maybe not or not. Biblically. <laughs> um, when he's leaving, she says, oh, so the next time I see you, you won't remember me. And he said, no, I'm sorry. And then she she kisses him. Oh, they do kiss in that moment. That's right. <laughs> After they've had sex or not. And she says, I think you will. And then when he shows up in the diner, he's she, he has no clue. He walks right past her. And I was like, I wonder if that's motivation for how much of a bitch she is when he first arrives. Because that first few moments when we we meet her, she just comes off like a real cow. And obviously, it's very layered and there's a lot of stuff going on that could, you know, be why. But, um, well, from her perspective, like, she basically is like, she's at work one day. And then this guy shows up <laughs> in her boyfriend's clothes, in mm-hmm. her boyfriend's car, after her yeah. boyfriend was supposed to go do a drug deal, a, you know, mm-hmm. risky proposition. And he's like, hey, what's going on? You know, like he doesn't, <laughs> he's like, I'm here to meet you because we've met before. And she's like, no, we haven't. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she kind of, you know, she tests him by, uh, by <laughs> getting everyone to spit in the cup. Uh, yeah. which is a, I like the guy at the bar. <laughs> yeah. He's like laughing his ass off when he starts drinking it. <laughs> Um, so she's like, this guy is responsible. Like she, I don't know if she knows he's the one who killed him. Right. Um, but surely she knows something bad has happened and he was clearly involved. You know, he was there. Uh, Mm -hmm. so she has good reason to not like the guy. Um, and then the, the next time they meet, uh, she like brings him to his house or brings him to her house and then he's there mm-hmm. for a bit and then she comes back yeah okay and then she comes back and she's like dodd is coming after me so basically because right. jimmy didn't show up with the money from the drug deal this guy dodd is like gonna go after her so now like because of him um she's fucked so she's like well i'm gonna manipulate this guy into getting rid of dodd for me which she does but then they have another encounter where I think in that moment she actually does like it is actual sort of sympathy and, and Mm -hmm. connection between them. Um, so then when they meet again in the diner towards the end of the sort of linear narrative, you know, like she is kind of like Mm -hmm. really sad that he doesn't remember her. (laughs) Um, you know, so like, I, I think that's, that's, that's really interesting because like to have a character that you kind of like go up and down or like can feel complicated about that. Like, I think that's, mm-hmm. that's good writing and, and good yeah. acting to pull that off successfully. I agree. I like the moment in the cafe where he, we see his wife for the first time. Like when she says, don't just tell me about your wife, like close your eyes and, and see her. My heart broke. Um, all the stuff with his wife breaks my heart, obviously. Uh, at this point, we don't really know what happened. We Well, we we think she was raped and murdered at this point. Um, and then obviously we come to know the entire story and this story of, of Sammy Jenkins and, and his wife. But um, I, I th- that's the first time we see her and where obviously we feel the most sympathy for this man and i think he plays those things very well the the moments where he's remembering his wife or speaking about his wife there it's almost borderline cheesy or a little dramatic but i think it works 
because this movie does have a certain style and a vibe that it's going for and it it is that revenge story of you know this this huge love that he had for his wife so i think it ultimately works yeah they kind of like present it in different ways depending what part of the uh the past they're referencing but like yeah there's the like the good moments and like that that part between him and natalie like that is her being i think kind of sweet like she is literally saying like you know you 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 like to remember her the good parts you know like Mm -hmm. like do that you know um and and when they show that kind of stuff it's very like you know happy ideal young marriage stuff going on but then the other stuff is like they show the murder stuff and that stuff's all like fucked up and gruesome fuck when they because they do it very abruptly at one point we go from his narration voiceover black and white scene to her being wrapped in a shower curtain and struggling to breathe and it's it's cut very in, into these very short little clips really jarring yeah they're just like flashes of like Mm -hmm. murder movie stuff (laughs) uh we get a conversation between um teddy and lenny in a diner so like teddy's like hey watch out for this this natalie girl she might be bad news so like you know i don't know if teddy and natalie directly interact they kind of like she knows that like jimmy is involved with a guy named teddy and I, i don't know if she knows that lenny's involved with teddy she must Um, but anyway, they're they're in a diner having a conversation. I thought it was an interesting conversation because, uh, uh, Teddy's basically saying like, you can't just kill people based on your notes and your photographs. And Lenny's Mm -hmm. like facts. He's like, I've got (laughs) facts. And, and, Mm -hmm. you know, like when, when investigate, when police investigate things, they do it based on facts, not on memories and memories can be distorted and stuff like that. I actually thought that was really interesting because like, I think a lot about the the concept of a fact. I think this is something that comes up a lot in like politics these days about like, oh, people mm-hmm. are getting bad facts. And and the, the the you know, what is a fact? What is true? What is accepted as a fact is like uh very much up for debate, you know, and and it's it's contextual. And in the case of this story, like Lenny believes in his facts, but he he the fact is underpinned by like, well, he wrote it down on a piece of paper so at some point his past self felt it to be true and he just in the future is accepting it as a fact it's not a memory yeah. and it's like a weird different kind of like uh archival um document or thing that mm. that sort of moves into the future i don't know it was a little weirdly philosophical uh i liked it yeah and i i think that really ties in nicely to i mean those scenes at the end or his beginning i guess where he is literally like lying to himself as he's writing down do not believe his lies because he wants to maintain this narrative that he's been pushing on himself and does not want to believe what teddy has been telling him and it's almost like (laughs) this willful ignorance in order to maintain his quote memories so that again he can have meaning or he can have some sort of purpose which i think ties nicely into all of that as well yeah he really does uh like okay so to get a little nitpicky about like the science of this (laughs) throughout the movie it's kind of established that his memory is pretty short um Mm -hmm. if something kind of happens to distract him that can also uh you know make him make him lose it that end part, which is the beginning of the story, I feel like mm-hmm. a good like fifteen minutes, maybe longer, of like <laughs> movie time happens where he is like coherently following the plot, um, because it's kind of the only way it makes sense. Because like mm-hmm. uh, Teddy explains, you know, like, well, you already did it, and uh, and now you're doing this other stuff. And Lenny's not happy about it. You know, he's like, oh, I've been used and this is uh, like I'm a murderer and and all that stuff. So he kind of, you know, he doesn't want to deal with that. So he makes a conscious decision in that moment to set himself up to go on another quest. But to me, that all feels like very self-aware. Well, one, you know, he's holding a a thread of thought for a pretty long time to to actually get to that point. Um, But also it's very sort of like self-aware of like everything. Like you almost kind of Mm -hmm. have to have the big picture to have figured that out. I don't know. I I guess that's something in this movie where I, I, 
I kind of feel like he remembers more than really makes sense for it all mm-hmm. to kind of logically make sense. Yeah, I s- totally see where you're coming from. I guess um, I would say he's not really being distracted in that moment. Maybe like it seems like that is when his memories kind of go and he has to sort of reset. But we don't see enough of his life to really fully understand that. If we're considering the Sammy story, we're supposed to believe that this is a a legitimate condition that he has and he has no control over it. Um, I guess the question I always leave with with this movie, no matter how many times I watch it, is how in control of his memory is he or how out of control of his memory is he? Um, And I think that that's the question that it it kind of raises. I'm thinking backwards now. This is, this movie has me fucked up. Okay. (laughs) I think that's the question that is raised when, when you're posing questions like that too, is like, because that's sort of what we're asking the whole time or what Sammy's wife was asking of him. And maybe this guilt of his is contributing to it. Like what is actual like truth again and fact versus what is he contributing to his condition or his state of mind? How much is it, you know, what's psychological, what's physical, what's blah, blah, blah. So I don't know. I think it just adds to the depth of the questioning for this movie for me rather than like have me go back and go, well, I'm not really sure if that makes sense. Yeah. uh, I accept it. (laughs) <laughs> I accept it too. Like it's 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 fine. Um it just I just don't totally understand, I guess. Uh mm-hmm. cuz yeah, it's implied like you know, there's that moment where he has self-awareness where he's like, "Okay, I'm going to I'm going to set myself up to keep keep being a de- detective here and kill Teddy." Um right. but also, you know, like he's got those police reports and there's all kinds of stuff crossed out and he's like, you know, Teddy's like y- you did that. <laughs> like they yeah. they weren't like that before. Um as well as, you know, like one of the big reveals in the movie, you know, we we hear the story of Sammy Jenkins and and his wife. Um uh and it turns out, oops, that was actually uh Lenny that yeah. insulins his wife to death. Um, mm-hmm. but he even says like, she wasn't diabetic, you know? And, and, yeah. and that was one where I'm like, okay, that's a memory he would have had before the accident. Um, mm-hmm. at least the fact that she was diabetic, that he's like, yeah. maybe now convinced himself isn't true, but like, maybe that that's also the case too. Like maybe there is, he, he can, cause they get at this with the, the, the flashback stuff that like, just by doing the repetition, you should still be able to learn. And apparently that didn't work right. for Sammy, but mm-hmm given that so much of that backstory is also not true, um, right. maybe it actually is working for Lenny. Like maybe he's forgetting that he's doing these things, but he, he does them enough that they actually work at the same time. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Let's talk about the Sammy Jenkins, uh, backstory. That's, um, yeah, a big part of it. That's kind of like the, the, the black and white, uh, B plot that we're getting um, interspersed with it is is mostly focused around that. Um, Stephen Tobolowski as uh, Sammy Jenkins, I love that guy. He's great. Mm-hmm. He plays a really yeah. good everyman. Uh, yes, except in this case, it's very tragic. Absolutely, and the woman who plays his wife, Harriet Sansom Harris, she's so good. She's so I have a visceral reaction to her performance. She's so anxious and distressed, and it's so heartbreaking. And they, I think that they're they play with each other really well, and and their sort of energy and states of being in these stories is really it's so heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah, he's just kind of like sort of helpless and hopeless, but also like uh still comes across as just like a normal everyday guy Mm -hmm. you know and lenny does say like well that was the secret was just to sort of like fake it you know like you 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 summon that look in your eyes of recognition and stuff but just as a uh performance you know i think that's kind of what makes it so heartbreaking watching him is like Mm -hmm. uh i he just he just seems like a normal guy but he's like totally he's helpless like a baby um yeah and you know the whole uh 
story with the insulin like that that scene where you know she's like it's time for my shot and she's like winding her watch back and he just keeps doing it and like she's she's becoming like more and more like you know like freaked out and and emotional uh Mm -hmm. and then she dies and he's like oh god and and like yeah that was just a brutal brutal scene (laughs) They, there's a moment when he's given her a few shots already and he's she looks distressed and he says don't worry it won't hurt and i was like no yeah i can't handle it it's it's so much and i i also really enjoy though the testing that they do with thomas lennon tom lennon which is weird to see him in a a role that is not like deputy dewey or something um not dewey what's his name Reno 911, where he's absolutely ridiculous. Have, you've not seen it? I've seen some Reno 911, but not, okay. not much of it. Um, he's so out of this world in those, and I've never seen him in a in a truly dramatic role before. Um, very short, uh, small role, but um, just weird to see him. But I liked I liked those moments with the repetition and him getting frustrated and you know giving the finger and saying you know the fuck is this yeah (laughs) just a test yeah heartbreaking and like really playing on this theme in this movie of of loss like everyone just lost everything in this movie they're just everyone is so incredibly desperate um which, as you said, like even even when they're all kind of maybe not awesome people, they're super sympathetic, and you understand everyone's why they're behaving the way they do. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, like I'm definitely sad that Joey Pants is dead because um, <laughs> I love him, but also he's mm-hmm. you know like he he wasn't enough of a villain to deserve that fate. Like in that moment, yeah. at the very end, Leonard kind of is the villain. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it's like I also like I think about like what the hell happens after this movie to Lenny, you know, because he killed Teddy and like Teddy was kind of like helping him, you know, like he he at least was sort of like making sure he was uh, roughly okay. Um, You know, where does he go after that? Like he he doesn't even have he doesn't got an ex John G to go after. Um, I guess he's got the, the car full of money still, so he'll figure something out. Yeah. Natalie and and uh, Lenny drive off into the sunset. I guess. In but, a very dirty Jaguar. Yeah. The amount of dust on that thing throughout this movie just makes me uncomfortable. It's a dusty movie. <laughs> uh, there's um, like the whole chase scene with Dodd. That's kind of funny. <laughs> Where he's like, ah, I'm chasing this guy. Oh, no, he's chasing me. <laughs> yeah, I like that moment. The Dodd stuff is like, I get why it's in there, but it seems almost unnecessary, to be honest. Yeah, that was something that confused me a little bit because I was like, Dodd, who is Dodd? Why is this happening? And Mm -hmm. narratively, it makes sense. Like once you understand the whole plot, it's like, okay, this guy was going after Natalie. So he and Teddy threatened him enough to leave town i guess i don't know why maybe he'll just come back the next day yeah, and do it, it again too like easy yeah <laughs> um, it does feel a little bit like as you go back you, you i i thought there would be more of dodd like i think he was going to be more of a, a character in the story but really he just kind of mm-hmm. he's just there for a little while yeah i don't feel drunk yeah (laughs) yeah oh that was also the thing i didn't really understand dodd comes into his room there's another man's clothes on the bathroom floor and someone in his shower like you can tell when someone's in the shower and he just comes in and takes a piss and starts to wash his hands before he opens the the shower door that confused me when you gotta go you gotta go (laughs) priorities that's fair uh, there's that whole scene with the prostitute that uh, is mm. clearly a little freaked out by by Lenny. Um, yeah. That was sad. Uh, that's a, yes. a, a a sad scene. Yeah, it's very weird. And okay, another little minor detail. In movies, whenever there's like a a, a spouse or a lover that has risen from the bed in the middle of the night and the other person like rolls over and is like they're gone if that person were there that person's hand almost always would just like smack the person right in the face and i always find it interesting 
to see actors just flop their hand over like a dead fish, like, oh, you're gone. Does I personally have never experienced someone just smacking their hand over to my side of the bed when I've been sleeping next to someone. It's a little more gentle and, and controlled, generally. That's the world of movie magic. Things don't <laughs> don't have to make sense. It really, it really just is that tiny thing that just gets to me. But yes, very heartbreaking scene and very, very sad. I think, is that when we get that little clip of him remembering her where he's pinching her on the leg? Yeah, I think so. I mean, that shows up a couple times. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, yeah, like as he's explaining what he's like, okay, so you're going to just like put all this stuff around the room <laughs> and then we're going to go to bed and then you're going to wake up and go to the bathroom. And she's like, <laughs> okay, buddy. <laughs> And then after that, he like goes and burns a bunch of his wife's stuff, which was uh, real sad. Yeah, very sad. His, his monologuing through that all was pretty, pretty heartbreaking of like, how many things do I have to burn or how many things have I burned of yours? Um, it, it, again, sort of back to his whole monologuing when he's with Natalie and she's asleep and he's talking about um, like waking up and just feeling like his wife has just gone to the bathroom in the middle of the night, but he knows she's not coming back. But how long has it been? And we actually don't find out how long it's been. We don't know if this has been like three years or three months since she's died, really. Yeah, that might actually be explained somewhere in the DVD extra stuff because... (laughs) uh, so, okay, I have the DVD in front of me here. I don't mm-hmm. know if you can kind of see this. So they leaned really heavily into the whole theme of, like, he was a psychiatric patient that, like, escaped, um, mm. which I guess must be the case. They don't explicitly say it in the movie. But right. It, but I, I think that is what happened because they do show, like... Um, in I think one of the last flashbacks about Sammy Jenkins, they they very this is the most like late nineties Fight Club esque <laughs> thing where like you know uh, it's it's Sammy looking real sad in the chair and then someone walks mm-hmm. by and then for like half a second it's Guy Pierce and you're like oh shit um, I didn't notice that yeah yeah it's uh, it's really quick but they mm-hmm. they show him in the um, the mental institution and so the packaging for the DVD is like designed to look like a doctor's clipboard. And it's got, like, this, like, extra paperwork stuff. And, like, the front of it actually says, like, uh, you know, the admission of Leonard Shelby, an alleged mentally sick person. And it's, like, his, you know, paperwork for the hospital and stuff like that, which is a huge spoiler for for (laughs) the movie. I I think that's a very special... I have that same edition. I think that's a very special edition that only real nerds about the movie were into. They just assume... (laughs) They assume you know. I don't think you just walk into any HMV and pick that off the shelf. You know what I'm saying? Well, I don't know. Maybe. So they, they had sales. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We don't know how long it's been. You know, there's whatever the backstory is for all of this. Like, you kind of got to fill it out in your head. I'm kind of glad mm-hmm. they don't get into it that much. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting to think about, like, you know, how the hell did he get out of there? How, how did he even <laughs> get this far? You know, like, he's actually surprisingly yeah. capable for... <laughs> for having that condition Mm -hmm. how does he eat food does he know when to eat food he's very very thin in he looks near malnourished in this film so maybe he's not really eating that's a good point yeah (laughs) uh yeah i don't know i'm not going to keep running through all the like plot let's just jump to the uh when the time changes forward and get to that last scene does that sound good Sure. Oh, okay. But one thing we're talking about little like trivia facts and stuff too that I want to touch on. Okay. When Teddy is waiting outside in Lenny's stolen, in the stolen car that Lenny's driving around and he's like, Natalie's not good. Do not trust her. Write that down. Do not trust her. Lenny writes it down, but he uses a ballpoint pen and he scribbles it. And it does not look like his his normal writing. I always in, thought that that was intentional. So that that was a note to himself of do not trust this person. Don't trust this writing. But then I was reading through some trivia stuff. And on Amazon trivia, where I watched this on Amazon Prime. 
it's listed as a goof. And I was just wondering what you thought, because I thought that was so intentional. I feel like there's no way that they would goof that bad when that's such a central part of this narrative yeah i think whoever added that to amazon was mistaken that was like clearly he was writing it in a way that if you looked at it later he would know uh i thought maybe he used his other hand or something um Mm. but yeah no way no way was that a mistake that was super deliberate yeah (laughs) no one doesn't goof like that excuse excuse me you know the man does not make mistakes. Yeah. So basically, the 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 timelines kind of converge, and uh, we go from the intro stuff. So yeah, the whole time he's talking on the phone, he's talking to Teddy, right? Yeah, which is weird because Teddy goes through all of this about the guy you're talking on the phone is a cop, and he's a dirty cop, and he's describing himself and what he's doing, but as if he is another person, which is super interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, I guess that he knows he can do it, theoretically. (laughs) Is this after he went and found Lenny at the tattoo parlor with with the, like, tattoo artist that looked like an old version of Fortune Feimster? I don't know who that is. (laughs) She's She's a comedian and an actor. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was after that. I think you're right. Yeah, because he's like, hey, guy, you gotta calm down. You're not being very subtle about this. You're wearing the clothes of the guy you killed and driving his car and you parked it out front. Yeah. And I wouldn't know like how long. Well, and I guess they, they, he says this himself. What is the exact, hmm, how am I supposed to heal if I can't feel time? And that's totally how you as a viewer feel because he's in those clothes for a long time. And you're like, is this over the course of a few days? Is this happening in one afternoon? Like, we don't really know. And I think that's also a really interesting way of presenting this to us as an audience. Yeah, you don't know. I kind of feel like this is like a like two days Mm -hmm. because but you don't really know until it's over, I guess. Like, you, you don't necessarily know that the stuff you're seeing at the beginning and the rest right. of the movie or you know the 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 flashbacks and stuff like that you don't know mm-hmm. when that is you know that could be any yeah. possible time um but i think like you know he he gets out of his hotel he goes and and murders jimmy um then he goes to the tattoo shop then he goes to the bar uh and then he goes to natalie's and then like he stays the night and then mm-hmm uh i feel like it's a day or two i don't i don't feel like it's a a lot of time but it's kind of tough to wrap your head around it just the way it's presented Mm -hmm. um okay just a a nitpick here so when they're in that abandoned warehouse and he kills jimmy teddy shows up and he kind of plays dumb with teddy uh he's like hey mister hey mister um and then teddy comes (laughs) in and he's he hits teddy with his camera to like (laughs) <laughs> knock him out and it's like bro like that's your that's your life right there you yeah. know you can't just be smashing that i didn't even know what it was i thought it was something he found on the floor because i couldn't quite make it out on my screen so yeah now that you've pointed out that it was his camera that's mm, i mean he has just killed someone he's freaking out i guess it's a sturdy sturdy polaroid yeah so I think this last 15 minutes, this actually is like the most like kind of, you, you know, movies have twist reveals and that can be like a really, oh, wow, I, I didn't see that coming. Like Fight Club is, a, is an example of like, oh, there's a twist at the end. Holy cow. Um, <laughs> I think this movie, uh, it does that. But I think this actually is kind of like the best, the best version of that, because I, I think the yeah. last 15 minutes of this movie um, are like just so intense. Um, yes. And there's the reveal but also like the 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 exchange between them like the scene uh between guy pierce and joe pantoliano when they're when he's telling him you know like you've already done this you know and and like it's the most like that's where i was just loving joe so much like just his his (laughs) delivery of everything was you know you're not a killer that's why you're so good at it um (laughs) it's very intense you know and it's uh and it's kind of like it's dark you know you're like oh man Mm -hmm. like he's like i've manipulated him um for you know well it's your thing but but the other thing too you know my thing too (laughs) 
Um, but so you, you get a lot of like, you know, reveal of, of the story and kind of resolution in that sense. You, you kind of figure out what went on. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, and then you also get this, you know, good, uh, performance between them. And then it really does like the ending to sort of end at just like a sort of almost arbitrary point in the movie, um, or in the narrative, you know, it's just Mm -hmm. like, uh, like, I guess that's, that's ultimately what is kind of interesting about this movie is that like, if you were to watch this linear, linearly, um, it would make sense, but like certainly would not have the emotional impact it, it has. Mm-hmm. And especially like if you were to say like, what would be your like ultimate scene or, or, you know, like a, a heavy moment to end on it, it wouldn't be the part where he just stops his car at the tattoo shop. But that moment is very <laughs> right. poignant because he's like, you know, right before then he's like, all right, I gotta, I gotta have a purpose in life. So fuck it. <laughs> you know, you're going down next. Um, mm-hmm. and then he's, you know, he's, he's driving there and kind of like thinking in his head, like, uh, you know, like I need to have, um, a purpose in life. Uh, I, yeah, I have to believe in a world outside my mind that my actions still have meaning. Um, and he's like, you know, having flashbacks to, to his wife and stuff like that. And those actually, those flashbacks at the end were, were almost like, disturbingly sad where Mm -hmm. he's laying in bed with his wife but he is all tattooed up um and he actually has over his heart the tattoo that says like i've done it Mm -hmm. um yeah it's just interesting because like narratively you know in terms of the story like that's kind of like a whatever moment but it Mm -hmm. just works the way it's executed that that is the ending yeah it's it's got this sort of um disturbing it it's it's we leave on a disturbing note i think also because lenny has been presented or um portrayed through all of this as quite a gentle person who's really just heartbroken and on this mission and his reason is to get revenge on his wife and then at the end of our experience we see him almost shifting that to it's not necessarily about her and revenge and closing that chapter. It's really like you've said, you know, he's, he talks about having meaning and purpose in his own life. And it really, I think this is why this movie is one of those (laughs) that you could watch over and over and find new things and just keep asking more questions without the movie diminishing at all in quality or um, impact because this character seems so different at this point like he he really does our perception of him or for me anyway really shifts in that moment and you're like this is not the man i thought i was just on this long journey with and that you know his reasoning for doing everything that he has done is not actually what he said it was or what i thought it was it's upsetting yeah, I mean, it kind of is like a villain reveal at the end. Mm-hmm. Like he is, it, it it subverts what you thought it was going to be because the opening is like he kills uh, Teddy and you're like, well, Teddy must have been the bad guy. And, you know, as you're going backwards, uh, I mean, it's hard for me to like, it's hard for me to see this movie fresh, you know, just because I've, I've seen it and I kind of yeah. know the details, which sort of makes it harder for me to pick up on the details at the same time because i'm just like (laughs) whatever i know what's going on so Mm -hmm. uh yeah he's he's the good guy on a noble quest and and you're as clueless as he is so you're very sympathetic to Mm -hmm. to you know his his position and what's going on and then at the end it totally does reverse where it's like actually um it well there's two things like one is like you know he hasn't been killing he's already he, he already killed the actual killer and even that right. i think is maybe debatable like a, you know teddy could be lying there um yeah. but he's already killed the killer and you now know he's killed two people that are not the killer um which is like oh shit uh but also <laughs> it, it, it's a character turn um Mm-hmm. well actually and the other big detail is that he was the one who accidentally killed his wife like you find out that all the Sammy right. Jenkins stuff was like you know projection perhaps of uh like I'm not even clear if there was a real Sammy Jenkins um yeah you know or, or well, there might have been but like the, the the diabetic wife stuff wasn't part of that well at the end does uh I mean it's in I don't know the fact that the guy he kills I can't remember his name right now uh, that he 
Jimmy says Sammy at the end. And there there were moments where I was like, is this is his name actually Sammy? <laughs> like there were there were there were weird moments like that as well. So like, yeah, how much exists as as Sammy Sammy and how much exists as Lenny and where is that line? I think the when the guy says Sammy, I think that was because he just like he, he, you tell everybody that story it gets better every time you tell it. <laughs> like, I think that is his thing. So mm-hmm. that that made sense to me. Um, Teddy does say like, well, Sammy was a, a fake or whatever or a fraud or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. There might be a real Sammy Jenkins. But anyway, uh, yeah. So there is kind of like the reveal of like what has actually happened in the story. But I think the big reveal is is the change in character because mm-hmm. which is the part where that maybe doesn't make a certain amount of sense to me, um, yeah. you know, which is to have the clarity in that moment to sort of decide that you were going to keep this going. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I guess it could happen, but, uh, but certainly from a story perspective, it really just, you just go, Oh shit. And, <laughs> and, and it kind of like, you know, if you, if you know something about a person and then you like think about the story again, that can change how you look at things. But what's interesting in this case is that like, even if he did in that moment, he was the villain that kind of does just get freshly wiped away. The cash gets cleared and then mm-hmm. he is, you know, he is who he is. The, the, the sort of lost little protagonist for the rest of the movie, which just makes mm-hmm. it really bizarre. Yeah. Um, so I guess some other details about this movie. Uh, I like the music in it. It's got a pretty good mm-hmm. score. Um, there's like, a kind of theme that that hits a couple times uh, at the beginning and at the end that kind of sounds interesting. I'm really bad at describing movie scores. Um, there's like a lot of there's there's a there are a lot of strings throughout this movie and it's very emotionally stirring. It's got some feeling to it. Mm-hmm. I like the moment the the I don't know what you call them <laughs> the soundscapes. I don't even know weird digital noises that we hear under his narration or his voiceover or um, his phone caught conversations in the black and white. I love that. There's, it really just sticks with you and adds something to the mood of those scenes. I don't even know what I can describe those ones. It's just, it works. Yeah. That uh, I had forgotten about all that stuff, but as soon as that first Mm -hmm. black and white scene started, it's got this weird, like, there's just kind of like some little noises and some little like blippity bloops mm-hmm. that kind of yeah. <laughs> happen. It's really strange, um, but it works. It gives those scenes like a really creepy vibe, which, you know, yeah. like he's in a hotel room alone on the phone in black and white, which is much scarier. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it really kind of paints a, a scene there with that, uh, that, that soundscape. Mm hmm. A uh, little uh, IMDB trivia here. This made me laugh. Director trademark, Christopher Nolan, Dead Wives. Leonard <laughs> seeks revenge for his dead wife. Dead Wives also pop up in Inception, Interstellar, and The Prestige. Wow, guy. He really, he, he knows what he likes and he sticks to it. Time travel, memory, dead wives. It's a winning formula. <laughs> also, uh, the shooting location changed from Montreal, Quebec to Los Angeles. So oh. this could have been... En Francais. I'm sure they would have all, all spoke French if they filmed in <laughs> Quebec because that's the law. Yeah, yeah. Everyone would have learned French for the film. Yeah. I want to hear French with an Australian accent. Do you think he could do that <laughs> as good as his American? He doesn't sound Australian. He definitely does nail it. He, his, I was shocked when I first saw this. I think this is the first thing I saw him in, actually, and uh, was shocked to find out that he is Australian. Perfect. It's a real international cast. Carrie Ann Moss. I think she's Canadian, isn't she? She is. Yeah. There you go. All right. Well, I think uh, I think we've covered everything we wanted to with uh, Memento. Unless you had any other last thoughts you wanted to get out there. No, we got rid of it. <laughs> we we did it. <laughs> um, if you haven't seen this movie, you should not have listened to this podcast. But <laughs> if anybody in your life has not seen Memento, um, definitely show them this movie. It's really good. Uh, I don't hear people talk about it a lot these days, you know. Um, yeah, which is a shame. It's uh, I, it is it is a classic. Eighty five. <laughs> it's from two thousand. It's not that old. 
You were you were zipping up your sweater, Mr. Rogers style, saying, I don't hear people talking about this movie these days. Why don't the kids talk about Memento? I remember <laughs> I remember like it won something at the Teen Choice Awards or whatever that year. What? I think Halle Berry <laughs> announced that Memento won and the way she did it was she had it written on her chest and she like lifted up her shirt. Memory burned into my brain. Yeah. Yeah, a rough memory, I'm sure. Uh Traumatic. I think I, I hadn't even seen the movie then. I, that might have been the thing that got me to, to watch it. I was like, well, if Halle Berry is on board, <laughs> I'll check yeah, it out. Yeah, I think this this movie was, like, I was obsessed when I was younger. Everyone I knew that was into film was, this is all anyone was talking about for a long time. And to be honest, I still think this holds up. When I was watching it, it was like, they need to make more movies like this nowadays. And I think they do. It's just I think we see so much less of it because you need to go seek those things out. These kinds of movies aren't being put in front of us necessarily on a lot of streaming services. And we have no video stores to go browse and say, oh, what's this? This sounds interesting. We're not picking up, you know, DVD cases and reading the this, you know, synopsis on the back. And for nostalgia's sake, like I, I, this was a really great rewatching for me because it, it also took me back to a time where I was like pretty determined to become a filmmaker and just really reignited my love of film that had started when I was a little bit younger. Um, I, I love this movie. It's maybe one of my favorite movies of all time for so many reasons. Um, but you're right. Nobody really talks about this one anymore. People are, are big on Nolan, but, uh, I would say if you haven't seen this one in a long time and you are a Nolan fan, go back and rewatch it. I, I think it's probably my favorite Nolan movie. It's it's so good. It's so good. I would, you know what? And for what it is, I give it a nine. Oh, Jesus, I gave Best in Show a 10 out of 10 last week, I think. So I got to give this a 10 out of 10. Uh, 10 out of 10 uh, guy, guy peer streams out of... <laughs> Yeah, 10, 10 guy peer streams out of 10. Yeah, this is uh this is a really good movie. Uh I I think it holds up phenomenally well. I mean, it is like it, it what I think is great about it is that it's like if you had just a couple of actors and some cameras, but a really good script and a really good idea. Um, yeah. you know, the 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 power of of being smart and making a, a cool movie. Like it, it, I can understand why someone who is like young and wanting to get into filmmaking would, would see something like this and be like inspired and be like, shit. Yeah, I could do, yeah. I could do something cool like that. I don't yeah. need no computers to make a good movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, despite the fact that there is no actual, uh, make out or sex scene, uh, between <laughs> Carrie Ann Moss and Guy Pierce, clearly I just will trying to will that into existence. Um, I'm going to give this, uh, Nine and a half delicious mugs of beer out of ten. <laughs> yeah, point five off because there was no sex scene. Yeah, you know, if yeah. you want to, if you want to get to the next level, you know what you got to do. Give me that special edition. Give me that. Uh, <laughs> go all George Lucas and add it in. Well, maybe, maybe then uh, you better get your your buns ready for uh, next week's movie singing in the rain. If there, if there were ever a sexier movie made, I'm not sure. So interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you're setting yeah. some expectations here. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of X post watcho. Uh, as always, um, we would love if you could uh, rate us on any podcast platform that you are using. Um, you can get in touch with us at X post at gmail.com. And you can find us on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram at X Post Watcho. Um, and like Elana said, we'll be back next week to watch Singing in the Rain. Uh, see you next week. 